It's going to be an amazing day today. I can already tell. Every day is an amazing day. So our reading today for tithe and offerings is out of Malachi. Uh, it kind of fits the season we're in with being a rural church. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into my storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And that's never a good sign when he says, test me. <laughs> test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it is ripe says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, said the Lord Almighty. It, it's a reminder to us that the Old Testament set down the law and gave us a number. It said, this is the tithe. It is the first of your fruits. It is the first of ten rams to come through. That was it. And then when the New Testament came out, and Christ came out and said, that's not enough anymore. I will not accept that anymore. I want more. But what he wants is not more tithe. He wants it to come from our heart. And to be honest, totally honest, the tithe, writing the check is the easy part. Willingly and wanting to do it is the part I struggle with. Um, and that's the part that Jesus wants is he wants me to do it with a smile on my face, willingly writing that check. So with that, please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, please accept my tithe and my offerings in the manner in which I give it. I give it to you willingly. I give it to you happily, knowing that you will do more with this than I ever could, and that your blessings have made, made it available that I can do such with my tithe and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have just a couple quick announcements. Uh, the first one is uh, we're going to hold off on wood cutting for a couple of months during the heat of the summer, uh, which is good because I need to get my shoulders back in shape from uh, yesterday with the, the mall and the splitting wedges. Um, this summer, we're going to have a packing class for the youth group so if anybody out there has some panniers or a pack saddle or anything else, come see me under Buddy the Bull. Um, we try to teach some life skills and fun stuff for the youth group uh, other than just, you know, sitting around here and watching a video and then singing a couple of songs. Uh, and then the last one we have is next week. We go to one service. Next week, one service, 9 o'clock in the morning. 0900 for doctors, teachers, and former military people, and then we will have breakfast before the service. Nine o'clock, breakfast before the service, don't take the last burrito. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Bo. I'm going to stand here for a minute while my sisters come, and Mackenzie Brown, and you might have to adjust the cameras. <laughs> Let me come here and stand by me. Okay. I don't know if the cameras are working. Uh, okay. There. Is that your good side? Yeah. Um, <laughs> this wonderful kid, I call her a kid because she's just a kid. Um, she has served uh, at one of our ministries. Of the, our, Shiloh is part of a praise family of churches and, and ministries, and one of them is the ministry at called the Harriet House, named after my mom, Harriet. They've had, I think, a lot of girls go through. Do you know how many? Mm -hmm. 170 or so have gone through this house, and it's been a discipleship place and a place um, that is for uh, the development of strong spiritual women. And God has called that place and has continued to bless it. And Mackenzie is been there for the past six years and has made great strides and the house is doing so awesome 
And we just last week established a new leader of that house, Carmen, uh, and she is going to take it from here. Mackenzie is going to escape the valley and move to Central Oregon. So she's going, yay! She's going to live here. And she's looking for a school counselor job if there's any out there. Uh, anyway, uh, these are my two wonderful sisters, Nancy and Jane. And this is a recently found picture of my mother, Harriet, that the Harriet House is named after. So is that cool or what? And you need to hang that up in there. So we're going to do that. And would you hold on to this for a minute? And uh, we're going to pray for Mackenzie uh, and bless her and thank God for what has happened, but anticipating what God has in store. Come closer, yes. Come on. Maybe I should have you pray, Nancy. Would you do that? Oh, bless you. Lord, how good you are. You never change throughout generations. You are faithful. And we just uh, rededicate ourselves to the mission of reaching out to young women who need to know you and walk in your ways. I praise you, Lord, for Joe's vision for Harriet House and all those that are involved. And we just um, thank you again, Lord. Help us to see as you see in your wonderful holy name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Janie, for coming up here. It's not the easiest thing in the world. I have to do it every week. <laughs> I have four wonderful, crazy sisters. Um, as, a, as a kid born in a family of seven, I'm the seventh. My sister Jane is the, the first side of that book end, and I bring up the rear. And uh, it's good to have them in church today. And um, that house is next to Western Oregon University, and I just wanted to let you guys know that, and it's, uh, it has been an amazing, it's like a Christian discipleship house for women that are scattered all around the world. I want to share with you today as we're starting a new series and a new time in Scripture, we take... Uh, scriptures, sometimes like we just got through with Joshua last week and we had three guys from our speaking team uh, share about, which was awesome. And now we're starting a new one in the book of Romans, but mostly focusing on chapter 8 of Romans. Because chapter 8 is this amazing, pivotal chapter, and it's very important doctrinally. And I want to share with you uh, some doctrinal foundations. So if you're, if you're here today and you thought you'd have, um, it, I think doctrinal foundations sound a lot more boring than they are because it's really important that we know what we believe and that we get it and understand it. Um, <clears throat> We're going to be building a barn next to this place here to host the adults, and then this is going to turn into children, care, and youth, and event center. Um, so we're going to be displaced and moved over into a barn, which is cool. The plans are being made at this time, and it's invisible what's going on. You can't see it. I can show you kind of a picture of a barn, but it probably is going to look different than the picture because we're working on the structure. We're working on the foundation and the plans. And the water, we're going to be making a water cistern that's going to sprinkle this building and that building. You can't see it. It's going to be mostly underground. And here's what's hard for people sometimes to get excited about something you can't see. And that's what doctrine is. It's something that's there for us, and we get to live our life on it like we're building a house on a foundation. We get to enjoy knowing that there's truth under us. And that's what this is about. This is a, a time when we're going to uh, discover the truth that we're operating from so we can build our lives, build our families, build our relationships on truth. 
So that's what I want us to go to. Now, uh, I also want to let you know that <clears throat> you might not agree with everything I say doctrinally. In fact, I've already had some people send me nice little notes. It's awesome. Thank you for your encouragement. Uh, and I'm not opposed to those things. I really am open to training, <laughs> learning. I'm, all, I'm just, whatever a case, I'm, I'm in a, a learning mode too. But I want to share with you some true things, and we're going to go into Romans 8, but before we do, we have to go into 7. And seven, chapter 7 of Romans is a bit depressing in places, and it's tough. Uh, let's read it, and I will, uh, Paul the Apostle is writing about the struggles that he's been having in life, Okay. In verse 21 through 25, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin and at work within me. Verse 24. He said, what a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Verse 25, but thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now when you read this, Paul the Apostle is saying, what a wretched man that I am. This is Paul the writer of most of the New Testament, Paul the Apostle, the founder of so many important true things, the planter of churches throughout all of, all of that known part of the world. I was in Istanbul, Turkey, six years ago on a, on a trip. We were traveling to an area called the Zero Zone, where there is zero... Uh, knowledge of Jesus or a, a representation of people who say they're followers of Jesus. Now I know that that's just a, a, a broad stroke because I know there's believers in there somewhere, but we were in the zero zone up in northern Turkey. Then we went back to Istanbul, which was, there's the headquarters of the Greek Orthodox Church, and there's a Hagia Sophia where, you know, the big mosque that was was taken over, and, and there's all kinds of history there about the Muslim uh, takeover. And they would take over these churches with these beautiful mosaics, and they would plaster over the mosaics to make them a mosque. And so what's really cool is that the plaster was is being removed now of this uh, particular one facility I went to is a little chapel near the headquarters of the Greek Orthodox Church and it's a mosaic of Paul the Apostle as they pulled off this plaster it actually preserved the pictures that's cool now what's also cool is that most of the the people and the population of those days were not literate and they did not read. And so mosaics were really important. They, they're stations of the cross. They, they, would, they would speak about who Jesus was and is and they would communicate the gospel through art and through mosaics. And there's, I, I remember coming around the corner of this little place and there's this, the light was on it and it was this beautiful mosaic of Paul the Apostle. This little old wrinkly, ball-headed, homely dude with his hand in the air like this. And I was just like, I, it scared me for a minute. I thought, what a, what a saint. What a person who gave his life, ultimately, he was martyred. And I was like, this guy is a spiritual giant. It's like, I'm just standing in a, at a picture of him, and I was like, I should like, this is like a reverent moment. And then I'm reading here in Romans chapter 7. Oh, 
what a wretched man that I am. <laughs> it's like, what? So I imagine when he's writing this with his pen. So I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. This is me writing with this pen. For my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin and at, at work within me. And I think he b broke his pen or threw it and said, what a wretched man that I am, and probably stomped out and came back to it later. I don't know. I can't prove it. But he had a meltdown. Have you ever had a meltdown? Sometimes the three-year-olds will have meltdowns. What's wrong with that kid? Oh, he's just having a meltdown. It's okay. He's just hit bottom. <laughs> so if you're taking notes on your piece of paper, the, the first one I want to talk about is the meltdown. The hitting bottom. The, the place where you are saying, I can't do this life right. I want to do right, but I keep sinning. I keep blowing it. I keep messing. I try my best, but my mind still goes to bad places. I try to do my best, but I still have these habits I can't break. Or I still have these relationship issues. There's all kinds of things in this human experience that are places of, ugh. I played pickleball yesterday. They invited me to play. They wanted somebody to play with super old people that wouldn't. And I was trying to take advantage of one of them. <laughs> I had this awesome shot. They lobbed it right where I could just kill it and put that 82-year-old doctor in his place. <laughs> and I reared back and smacked it into the net. <laughs> and I go, Ugh! And they laughed at me and said, oh, I bet you really wanted to hit that right, didn't you? <laughs> yes. I had a meltdown. Just a little one. But isn't this interesting how that we, we live our lives and we come to this place of falling short, and we're frustrated with ourselves. Has anybody ever had that problem besides me? Oh, good. There's three of us in here. <laughs> we talk often about an alcoholic needing to hit bottom before he goes for help. Or we talk about, but can I just tell you, every one of us have to hit bottom before we get help from Jesus. There is not a coasting into Christ, there is a place where we are like Paul the Apostle, where he's like, ugh, I can't do this. Ugh. I keep, I want to hit the mark, and I'm missing it. There's the meltdown. Uh, secondly, there's the answer. Verse 25 of chapter 7 says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Oh, the second key thought is, there is the answer. Thanks be to God who delivers me. Um, my Escalade has a very smart piece of equipment in it called the Q system. It runs everything. It tells you stuff. It tells you when it's hot so it cools you down. And my, it fried. So I sent it off to a place to have it fixed because the dealership said it's like 3,500 bucks and I wanted to get it done for 429. <laughs> <laughs> and I found these folks on the internet. I'm sure they're safe. And I looked up the reviews, and it truly is safe. I, so I sent it off, and I got notice that it's going to take a two- to three-day turnaround 
for this to come back to me. They're going to fix my screen and all the things that were shortened out and not doing well. And I was really, I was like, well, 429 bucks. I paid them up front, sent it, and then I wanted to get it. And it's going to come to my house that I have in Dallas. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I wanted to get there, but it didn't show up, and it wasn't out for delivery or anything. And so I felt kind of bad about that, and I, I, Lila and I came over a couple days ago. Um, and then I got noticed as soon as I got here that it's arrived. Wow. You see, it, it went out for delivery, and it got shipped to my house. The package was in Seattle. It got shipped and delivered. Here are these words. It got delivered to where it's supposed to be. Can I tell you that this is important that we read this scripture and doctrinally understand. Thanks be to God who delivers us from this place to where we're supposed to be. The gospel of Jesus is not so transactional, and, and I get it. We need to make the prayer of salvation, and I understand. I got saved like 14 times before I came to my end of myself and realized it's not just done with words. I mean, these evangelists were good that we had in our local church. I got so I could resist them eventually. You know, just kind of, nobody here looking around. If you looked up, they would be right on you. So I just kept still. Waited for it to pass so I could go home. <laughs> I should do that with you guys once in a while just to see how it goes. <laughs> but the gospel of Jesus isn't so transactional as it is positional. Where we are no longer just saying things and, and mentally ascending to things. But we're moved, thanks be to God, from here to where we're supposed to be in Christ. You have been delivered from your place of sin and bondage, and now you are in Christ. Say something about that. Okay. You're right, the first crowd is more awake. <laughs> the answer is really important that you get this. That it's really important that you are positionally in Christ. You are his. You might think, and you might have problems with your thoughts. You might have lifestyle things that are going on, but you have come to Christ, and he has delivered you from there to here. You are in Christ. How does that look? Are you going to live perfect lives? No. Are you going to be awesome at things? that You might be awesome at some things, but you're going to fall short a lot of time. So this answer is not really uh, something you have to go by your feelings on. It's something that is like the doctrine of, the foundation of the barn we can't see. It's like the foundation of our faith. It's what we build our lives on. It's something you believe. I have been moved from here, and I've been delivered by Christ. I'm in him. I'm in him. Okay. So there's the meltdown that Paul the apostle had. There's the answer that he proclaimed. And now let's go and read Romans 8. This will feel better. Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of of sinful flesh, to be in a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, 
who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I was uh, asked to be a host of my brother-in-law and sister's ministry, Intercontinental Ministries. Do you remember that, Nancy? They were at a booth at the state fair. It was amazing that they picked me. I was 18, and I had hair, long hair, down to my shoulders. It was quite beautiful. <laughs> You're going to have to use your imagination, I guess. Next to me was the booth of, a, of the, the folks who were really into the law and keeping the Saturday holy and all that. And not eating certain things on certain days and moons and Christmas, Easter. Everything I was doing in my wretched life was bad. And they wanted me to know it. And there was a particular guy there that was on my case on a regular basis. Two weeks I was subject to this torture. But I was making, I think, $3 an hour, so it was worth it. So... I sitting there and it was getting long and the the guy was on my case about this and not doing that and not living right and all these things and I I was sure I was a mess I was a mess and uh, an old guy came walking by with a little sport coat on and he was old guy probably my age and he reached into his pocket and pulled out a New Testament. He said, oh, let me, tell, let me show you a scripture here. He got in the middle of our discussion and showed me the scripture in Romans where it says, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness sake. And the guy that had been hammering me said, well, wait a minute, what about this? I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're gonna be arguing with the Bible? I'm not gonna just, I'm not here for that. I'm just telling you this scripture and I think it, it will really help you. And I was like, yeah. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness sake. I'm already righteous. Whoa. You, know, you need to know that. You need to know that you are righteous in Christ. When you receive him as your Lord, whew, you're covered and you're righteous. And you say, well, Pastor Joe, I don't act righteous. I, I know. <laughs> but you are. It is not something you mentally ascend to. It's something you live in. You are in Christ. And the, it becomes a choice then for you to see yourself doctrinally accurate. I am in Christ. That choice is yours to see yourself in Christ. How you view yourself as in Christ. And the enemy would come at you and say, oh, no, that's not you. You're not one of them. You're outside. You're never going to be holy. You're just going to have this life of struggle. And you have to reply to him, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness sake. I am in Christ. I am righteous before God. That's important doctrine. We have to see ourselves as we really are. So I got out of the hot tub the other day, walked into the dressing room, and there's a full wall of mirrors. <laughs> and I was like, I thought I was alone. And then I thought I was invaded by some old, ball-headed, overweight guy <laughs> in the mirror looking at me. And I was looking at him, and I thought one of us is going to have to blink. <laughs> Oh, I use this scripture uh, in this context, and I think it really fits. Again, in 1 Corinthians, the love chapter, at the, towards the end, it says, For now we see through a glass dimly, but then we'll see face to face. Right now, you're going to be challenged. I'm just going to say, you're going to be challenged to see yourself in Christ. Because you're just looking through that glass darkly. But I'm telling you, have faith. Understand that you are in Christ and he sees you perfect. And you think, who, who is this person? I live a life and I look up and it's me. It's like, who is this guy? 
This is what Paul the Apostle was. He was like one of the spiritual giants, and all of a sudden he just throws his stuff in there and says, what a wretched man that I am. But praise be to God that I'm no longer that. I'm in Christ. It's positional. You are in him and covered by him. Phew. We have to get this because we live our lives often beating ourselves up and listening to voices. Maybe in they're not the next booth over. Maybe they're in the house next door. Maybe they're in just somebody in your family that's continually hammering you and telling you you're not good enough or that you've, you've got flaws. Just say, yeah, okay, but I am no longer there. I am in Christ, and there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We're in him. It's positional. It's not transactional. Where you behave well, then you're in. No. It's for us to just walk in. <laughs> we have a pastor in, in uh, McMinnville. Ron and Sue Noble lead that church along with Beto and Shelly Reyes. And Ron's dad passed away Monday, I think. He was 87, and he was an actual rocket scientist. And one of his jokes was, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, well, okay, I am a rocket scientist. And he was a rocket scientist and a very good singer and a really strong believer in the Lord, follower of Jesus. 17 grandchildren, 17 great-grandchildren, a huge legacy of people following Jesus because of his influence. He passed away, and Ron's father-in-law, uh, Keith, is six foot eleven and eighty-five or eighty-six, and he just has had a hard time with his heart working. And he was in the hospital, and Lila and I went to visit him on uh, Wednesday. And he was, the doctors met with the family and said, he's just a few days away from, from passing. And they're just like, oh, what is, you know, this guy is a sweet man. He was our main usher and greeter at the door, and, and six foot 11 guy, he's big. And he's greeting people and hugging them, and, and he sings this amazing tenor. He's got this amazing, in fact, Ron's dad, Ron Sr., and Keith, sang a duet at Ron's wedding back a long time ago. So before we left, Keith's daughter, Sue, said, let's sing, let's sing before we get, and we sang. And so we started to sing, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That was not very good, sorry. We sang it as a seniors choir back in the day, and Keith was the tenor of that. And Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And Keith kind of wakes up from his sleep and goes, bum 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 <laughs> And then started singing tenor with us. Oh, it's... So Keith, I got a text this morning from Sue, and Keith said, I'm going home today. And then he said to her, who's all these people in this room? She said, it's just me, Dad. And then she said, oh, that thin veil. This is what being in Christ is. We were once there, now we're in, and he covers us. And there is no, we're going to learn this more later, there's nothing that separates us from the love of Christ. And we are in him. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say there's a little condemnation once in a while from the church folks. 
there's no condemnation. I, I don't understand it. We tell everybody in the world that Jesus loves you just as you are. Come to church. And then they accept Christ, and then we're a little disappointed with him at all times. Oh, God help us. We've got to live doctrinally in this place of being in Christ and loving and accepting people just as Jesus has loved and accepted us. There is therefore no condemnation in Christ. So when your thoughts come at you, when you're, you're, the enemy of your soul is the next place over and he's hammering at you on the things that you've done wrong, tell him where you are. Don't tell them what you know. Tell them where you are. You are in Christ. Oh, so I need to know this deep inside. Let's pray about it. So Lord Jesus, as we sit here, Many of us have a hard time believing this truth. And I would pray, Lord, just like Thomas prayed, Lord, I want to believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, help our unbelief to help us know that when we are in you, we are covered. And there's no condemnation in you. So I... I pray against that, those thoughts, the evil one that comes to accuse us and to drag us down. We declare we are in Christ. And Lord, maybe there's someone here today that needs to make that commitment and follow you and say, okay, I want to be in Jesus, no longer living my own life. I want to walk with him and be covered by him. Help them make that choice today. As we pray, Lord Jesus, accept us, forgive us of our sin, place us, deliver us from the evil one and place us into your presence and into your covering. And we thank you for that. In your name, amen.